behalf of Apostle Brian and Reverend Dr. Antoinette, we welcome you to Christ Church and encourage you to invite others. I'm Minister Jeffrey. And I'm Minister Glennis. Christ Church exists to change the world by transforming people of all races and cultures into passionate followers of Jesus Christ. Our vision is extensive, but we serve a great God. This year, our focus is advancing together and we want you to join us as we serve our community and stand strong in our state, this nation, and abroad. You have a significant role in fulfilling the mission given to our church leaders over 30 years ago. That is why you're here today and you're ready to grow spiritually with other Christ Church members. Our Howell, New Jersey and online campuses gather weekly on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter with midweek connections that build our confidence in our faith walk. Join us on Zoom after service where you can chat with our leaders and church members. Trust me when I say you will be welcome with open arms. As Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is. And we believe that as you participate in this service, you will benefit from being in his presence. Let's join the rest of the congregation as we magnify the name of Jesus through song and the preach word.
has overcome, yes, he has overcome. We will not be shaken, we will not be moved. Jesus, you are here.
Thank you for the power of your love. Could we put our hands together and thank Jesus? Hallelujah. With hands lifted up, let's worship. Oh, you are welcome in this place, Holy Spirit. Speak, move, have your way. The 
He is worthy to be worshipped. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. As the worship team was singing this song, immediately the Spirit of God started reminding me in the book of Revelations as they were before the throne of God. All of heaven was centered upon the throne and, and you can see them crying thousands upon thousands of elders and angels and it says here, it says, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Somebody put your hands together for worthy is the lamb, his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Worthy is the Lamb. Let's sing that one more time. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Let's lift our hands to the King of Kings. Holy. Lift our hands to the Lord of Lords. Are you Lord God? Savior, the glorified Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You may be seated in this atmosphere. Mm, I feel the presence of God. Can you? Can you feel the presence of the Lord? Can you feel the presence of Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? It is in this holy atmosphere that we will partake in communion. As we were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We want to remind you that communion is a time of holiness. This is a sacred time. This was the sacrament that was passed down to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. We don't take it lightly. We don't trivialize with this sacrament because it's holy. It's precious. It allows us to receive from God and it strengthens our spirits as we worship him in this sacrament of communion. You know, when you pass through the doors, you should have received the communion cup. If you haven't, just raise your hand. Our ushers will be glad to serve you. You know, in the book of the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, there's this narrative about two disciples who were on their way to the road of Emmaus. And as they were on this road, they had an encounter with a special, a special stranger who, as they started talking to him about sharing all of what was going on, that Savior was none other than the resurrected Lord Jesus. And Jesus began to expound to them how from Moses through the prophets and the Psalms, how it all talked about what was going to happen to the, the Savior. And then when they got into the room, they sat down and, and as they were about to break bread, the scripture says that Jesus lifted that bread before the Lord and he blessed it and broke it. And at that moment of them about to commune, their eyes were open. When we participate in communion, we position ourselves for our eyes to be open, to receive from the resurrected Savior. 
the glorified Lord. Before we participate in communion, I want to encourage you now to examine yourselves, to make sure that there's no offense, no sin, no anything that may stand in the way of you and your Lord. Take this moment now to confess anything before the Lord. tells us that the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered all of his disciples together, kind of like how we're gathered here now. And he took the bread, lifted it up before the Father, and he blessed it. And then he broke it. And he gave to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together the bread of our Lord, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in like manner, Jesus took the cup and he followed the same. He lifted the cup before the Father and he blessed it. And then he drank some and he gave it to his disciples and said, This is the blood of my covenant which is shed for you for the remission for the forgiveness of sins do this drink this in remembrance of me let us drink the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ glory to God we thank God that he is holy and as we partake in communion as we symbol ourselves before him, I'm believing God to open up our eyes today like never before. Amen? Hallelujah. How many of us enjoyed that worship today? Did your heart burn as we sang holy, holy to the Savior? Glory to God. Underneath your seats are baskets. You can place your communion cups in those baskets. All right, and uh, we're going to continue to worship the King of glory. I don't know about you, but I'm so excited about Jesus, who's holy, the resurrected Savior, the glorified Lord. Somebody give the Lord a round of applause for his goodness, for his grace, the risen Savior, the glorified Lord, Jesus the Christ. He's our redemption. He's our wisdom. He's our power. He's our glory. Hallelujah. We're going to continue to worship our Lord as we prepare our hearts right now for our announcements through Christ Church News. Amen? Amen. God bless you. I'm Christina and I'm Joy and I can say that I mostly recovered from last week's Easter celebration. The fine arts team did a fantastic job mm -hmm. bringing Christ's resurrection to the forefront with song, dance, and our guest saxophonist Aubrey Welber. It was a great reminder that we can't have Easter without the resurrection. That's right. And you know what I was thinking, Joy? What? Is that since, once again, we were not part of the production from our fine arts team, mm. that we should just finally stay in our lane. And you know what our lane is? You ready for it? Look. The Tina and Joy Show. Chris, Christina. Yeah. We can't call it that. Why not? We're Christchurch News. Oh, well, you got to admit, it's got a nice little ring to it. The Tina and Joy Show. Anyways, you're right. It was so wonderful seeing so many people, old and new faces, this past Sunday joining us in the celebration. In fact, next week we get to celebrate again as we welcome more into the Christchurch family. On Sunday, the April the 14th, we will be welcoming our newest members during our worship service starting at 10 a.m. Our meet and greets serve as a way to publicly recognize and love on everyone who has made the decision to join the Christchurch family. 
and it's so easy to join. If you're interested in becoming an official member, we ask that you do see Deacons George and Lucy Rivera or anyone from our Connect team. That's amazing. Even the Bible embraces the power of collective effort and mutual support. And you know what they say, many hands make light work. Mm -hmm. Speaking of serving, we want to assure our online family that there are still ways that they can be a part of our growing community. In fact, I can't think of no one better than our very own Pastor Jackie McDaniel to tell us all about the changes happening. So check out what she has to share with us. Hi, I'm Pastor Jackie, and I'm here to share some exciting news with you. We've experienced spiritual growth and enjoyed great fellowship in our midweek shift Bible study since its inception some years ago. However, the time has come for us to shift and expand our focus. And so we're excited to share that Christ Church is implementing a new Bible study format, one that is designed to not only give attention to topical or thematic study, but so much more. We will now extend the conversation to include practical spiritual leadership as well as systematic, practical, biblical theology. Our goal as a leadership team is to cultivate disciples who will, as 1 Peter 3.14 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So be on the lookout for the following new dates. For our midweek shift thematic topical study, this will continue to run through May 31st of this year. For our midweek shift theological study, this will begin on June 1st and go through August 30th. And finally, our midweek shift leadership study will begin this fall on September 1st through October 31st. We invite you to join us as we shift our focus together and continue to build disciples who then build his kingdom. I look forward to seeing you on our next midweek shift. God bless you. Thanks, Pastor Jackie, for that exciting announcement. And that's not all that's happening online. This Friday, April 12th at 7 p.m., the Open Arms Ministries Caregiving Support Group will be meeting via Zoom. Our very own Minister Leroy Minson will be speaking on Care for the Caregiver, a discussion on mental health. All are welcome to join the Zoom with the meeting ID below on the screen. If you have any questions, please see Deaconess Angela Minson, Deaconess Darlene Hammond, or Darlene Ellis. Also this Friday, Christ Culture Young Adults are coming back together for Bible study at 7 p.m. here on campus. This month, we'll be talking about identity. Do you struggle with seeing yourself the way that God sees you? In today's world, where they could tell you that you could be whatever you want to be, let's look at what the Bible says about who we are in Christ. So come on out for a conversation that is sure to be valuable and build our young adults. Well, that's all the CC news we have for you today. Christ Culture teens and kids, your time with us has come and gone. You may go on up to your classrooms with your teachers for class. And for the rest of us, Apostle Brian Nattenson will be kicking off our new monthly theme this morning on stewardship with an on-time word. God bless you, and we'll see you real soon. Amen. You'll notice this morning that my better half is not with us. Uh, she is traveling back from Georgia today. She was there ministering all weekend. And so please keep her in your prayers as she is making her way back home to us. Amen. Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your goodness in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing here in Christ Church and more importantly, even in our lives. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that as we open up your word today that the Holy Spirit would come and visit us in a fresh way. Do something special, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, my Bible is open to Psalm 24. Would you please join me there? The book of Psalm, Psalm 24. The book of Psalms, the 24th division. Psalm 24. Look at somebody and say, Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Verse 1, a Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's, and all it contains. We could stop there and preach for the next year. 
on just the earth is the Lord's. But Psalm 24, the 24th division of the book of Psalms, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The world and those who dwell in it. Verse 2, For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory he may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. This grand hymn or psalm was probably composed and sung on the removal of the Ark of the Covenant from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David on Mount Zion. David tried to transport the Ark of the Covenant. However, he became afraid when Uzzah touched the Ark of the Covenant and he died instantly. David had never seen God like this. We know that David composed and comprised so many of the Psalms of God's holiness and of God's righteousness, but David had never seen God angry like this. The oxen stumble, Uzzah touches the ark, Uzzah dies immediately, instantly, dead. David becomes afraid and he says, how am I going to be able to take the ark of the covenant to the house of God in the city of David? Still afraid, he finds a man by the name of Obed-Edom, a priest. And they bring the ark of the covenant to Obed-Edom's home. David writes this grand choral piece that would be sung for generations to come. He declares in the opening stanza of this grand choral piece, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. The world and all who dwells in it. This is not an incorporation. There are no board of directors, no board of trustees, no chairpersons. This is not an S-corp, an LLC, or even a committee-driven organization. David writes it this way. He said, the earth is the Lord's. There is only one owner. There's only one. There is only one proprietor. Only one title holder, and that is the Lord, God Almighty, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Jehovah, the Creator of all heaven and earth. There's only one. And though there may be people that would try to claim ownership, the Bible is clear, the earth is the Lord's. And all it contains. All means all. And that's all that all means. He not only owns the earth, but he also owns his proprietor, his owner of all 
that it contains. He's the sole proprietor. He's the sole owner of the earth, all it contains, and those who dwell in it. He is not part owner of just one aspect. He is full owner and proprietor of the earth, all that it contains, the world, just in case we're unfamiliar with the earth and what that is. He said the earth, everything it contains, the world, just in case, and those who dwell in it. John Wesley put it this way, when the possessor of heaven and earth brought you into being and placed you in this world, he placed you here not as proprietor, but as a steward. Not as owner, but as a manager. Not as one that is the possessor, but the one that is a caretaker. So for the month of April, our focus will be on the topic of stewardship. And today I want to share with you a message that I've entitled, Managing God's Stuff. Managing God's Stuff. Because we've already established, in a very clear way, the earth is the Lord's. And all it contains, the world and everything in it. And his ownership comes as a result of creation. And so this morning we'll be talking from the topic, managing God's stuff. Now, I do want to say that I was, as I was preparing my message this morning, and, and, uh, and, and, and we work hard, right? Whoever's up here preaching, and we've got just a stable full of great preachers and teachers in this church, don't we? I mean, just, just a stable full of great preachers and teachers, anointed men and women. So come on, ladies, you ought to say amen to that. Because you might go to some places and they tell you a woman can't preach. A woman can, she might be able to teach children's church, but only for certain age groups, maybe. But uh, my problem is, is that what do you say to some of the women that stand up here and preach in the anointing of God upon their lives? How do you discount that? How, how do you say God isn't with them? All right, that's for a different day. It's for a different day, a different sermon. Managing God's stuff. By a show of hands, how many of you would say, Pastor, I have special talents, abilities, and resources, and I realize that these talents, abilities, and resources have been given to me by God? Come on, by a show of hands. You say, God has given me certain talents, abilities, and resources. Come on, I want you to put your hands up nice and high. And you say, Pastor, I know that God has given me that. Amen. Come on, give yourselves a good hand clap of praise. Now, I want you to realize something, though. I, I mean, just in, 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 in an in a afterthought way here, that these talents, these abilities and resources are never given in their full maturity. Never. They're never given in their full maturity. You're, when God gave you gifts, talents, and abilities, and resources, he didn't give them to you in their most mature way. In fact, what he has done is given them to you in their most immature way, in their most basic way. And it is up to you and to me to recognize our gifts, talents, abilities, and resources, and then to so effort and time and energy to figure out what they are, how they work, and how they can increase so that way God can use me in my life while I am here on the earth to make a difference, to make an impact, to bring change in the earth. 
They're never given in full maturity. They're always given in immaturity. They're always given in their most basic parameters. And it's up to you and to me in order to sow effort and to sow time and energy and educate ourselves and experience in order to grow them because God will ask for an account of that. Say, I already did my part. I already did my part. Now it's somebody else's turn to do their part. It's not even biblical. Can we just call it what it is? It's not but flesh. Let's just call it what it is. It's just flesh. I already did my part. I'm just going. I'm just going to ease into this thing. I'm just going to retire. I'm just going to hang out, and God's going to have to raise up somebody else to do it. As long as we have breath in our body. It ought to give God praise in everything that we do. It ought to give God praise. Just because you have been doing it for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years doesn't mean that God doesn't have another 1, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years left for you to go ahead and be used by Him. So don't sit on the sideline. Don't, 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 don't say, don't say, hey, hey, take me out, coach. They got this new thing now in the NBA where they're managing minutes. Managing minutes. Star players don't want to play. They need to rest. Getting paid $100 million. People that can't even afford $20 spending $500 for a ticket to go see their favorite player who's making $100 million and he's sitting over there with his hand in a container of popcorn. Put on your shorts, get your sneakers on, get in the game. Get in the game. Truth is, God has given every one of us special talents, abilities, and resources. And I need to say this to you this morning that I'm not concerned about God doing his part. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says this, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Today my concern is not how well God is able to use you, but how well you are able to be used by God and what you are doing in order to give your gifts, talents, and resources to Him. So that way we can be found as faithful stewards. Join me in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 25, please. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, speak in great detail about being a good steward and of being a good steward of God's resources. Parable goes into great detail about what happens when you don't manage God's stuff well. The Bible tells us, and this is not the correct passage of Scripture, so don't try to figure out what it is that I'm saying right now by looking at the screen. It's not going to help you. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 and 30 tell us that when you don't manage God's stuff well, he takes it and he gives it to somebody else. You say, man, the earth is the Lord's. Everything in it, the world. When we don't manage what God has given us well, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 and 30 tells us that God takes it, gives it to somebody else. I don't know about you, but I don't want God taking anything from me that is not from Him. In fact, what I want is God to give me more of what is of Him. And if he is taking anything, let it be of my flesh and things that are not from him. Can I just, can I, can I say that? Let him take the things that are not of him. 
but give me more of the things that are from him. But the parable tells us, not that one. The parable tells us that God takes whatever we mismanage and gives it to somebody else. But this morning, I'm not talking from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. This morning, I want to talk with you from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. So please join me there this morning. Matthew's gospel, chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, the bridegroom is an old age term that what we have done is we have cut off the front part of that, and we just say the groom, right? So so we've got the bride dressed up in white or whatever color she may choose to wear at that moment, and then we have the groom. But in old age... The language was the bridegroom. The kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were prudent. They were smart. They had wisdom. They had intelligence. They had the capacity to think in an independent way. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent, the smart, the wise, the intellectual took oil in flasks along with their lamps. So let let me give you the picture. Ten women, all a part of the bridal party. But things are being delayed, and it's at night. And so there are no streetlights. There is no JCP&L, Atlantic Electric, PSE&G. The only way that they had light was by having oil-filled lamps. And so there are ten women... Five of them say, man, things are really getting late here, but we're, we're going to have to go out there and meet the bridegroom. Uh, let's, let's go. All of them say, let's, sounds like a plan. But five of them say, you know what? I, I don't know if we're going to have enough oil. They get all the way out there, have a party, and then make it back home. It's going to be dark. There's no streetlights. I don't know if I'm going to make it back home. Let me take some oil. Just in case. The other five say, You want us to do what? You want, we're not taking any extra oil with us because this is going to be quick. We're going to go out there, we're going to find the guy, we're going to have a big party, we're going to have enough oil in our lamps, and then we're going to get home, and everything's going to be good. Now, verse 5. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, he was taking his time. He was chilling. He was relaxing. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom come to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Going out. Verse 9, but the prudent answered, nope. Mm -mm. No way. 
Not happening. Verse 9, but the prudent answered, no. There will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. Verse 10, and while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. In essence, the ones that were prepared, the ones that were ready to be used by God, the ones that were managing their resources well, when the bridegroom came and the feast started, they went inside. But the other women in the story, the five others who were not prepared, they were not ready, they were not managing God's things well, had to leave and go and buy some oil from the dealers. When the party started and the door was closed, they were excluded. You see, Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 10, Jesus gives us a glimpse into how kingdom living impacts our stewardship of God's stuff. The kingdom, or a better way of saying it, the king's dominion, affects how we live our lives and what is our priority. Listen, everything cannot be an emergency. Everything can't be an emergency. I sit in some of these meetings and I watch people constantly on their phone, constantly solving problems. And they're looking at me and my phone is on mute, it's tucked away somewhere else. The only time when I'm in a meeting and I get a phone call that I'll actually step out and take is if it's from one of my kids or my wife. Everybody else can wait. But if one of my children call and I'm in a meeting, if possible, I will stop, excuse myself, and go answer the phone. Why? Because they're my children. They've got direct access to me. It's, it's what they have. And I will stop what I am doing. I don't care who I'm meeting with. I will stop what I'm doing and say, wait a second. My, one, of, one of my children or my wife is calling me. Excuse me. I must take this call. Because nothing, no meeting, is more important than wanting to see what's going on in their lives. And the same thing with my wife. If she calls and I'm in a meeting, excuse me, my wife is calling. Now, if that person's got a problem with that, then they got a problem with that. So that's my wife. I got to go home to her. I got to sit across the dining room table from her. And when she give me the little eye, she give me that, brother, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Everything cannot be an emergency. It can't. Everything can't be a battle. I'm always fighting. I'm always in a battle. I'm always in an argument. I'm always looking for a new job. I'm always looking for a new car. I'm always looking for a new opportunity. Everything can't always be a battle. Can't always be a battle. If everything in your life is always a battle, then perhaps it's time to draw close to God and let God draw close to you and rest in his peace. Can somebody say amen? amen. Everything can't always be an emergency. Everything can't always be a battle. Everything can't demand your entire attention. And when you boil down the entire parable of Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 10, this is the problem. Everything else is taking priority over having enough oil to keep the lamp burning. Everything else is taking priority. Everything else is taking priority. Kids to dance lessons, soccer practice, football practice, basketball practice, choral practice, field hockey practice, lacrosse practice. Everything else taken priority. Love your husband, love your wife, but they cannot be a priority over God. God first, everything else behind that. 
You see, for the people that were here, the, the five foolish, everything else was taking priority over having enough oil to keep the lamp burning. Ten women went out with their lamps ablaze. Five women take extra oil with them just in case they get delayed. The other five don't plan ahead and figure that it's going to be a quick affair. But unfortunately, the groom shows up while the five women were out trying to find oil. Five women who ran out of oil too soon failed at managing their resources. The resources that God had given them and consequently were shut out of the wedding feast. Of all the things that God gives us in our journey through this life and in preparation for the next, He gives us life and breath. God gives us health. God gives us loving relationships. God gives us salvation. God gives us gifts, talents, and anointings. And God gives us material things. But what this parable teaches is that more than all these things, we need enough of the Holy Spirit and His oil to get to the end of our race. What he teaches in this parable is that we can have riches and we can have fame and we can have followers and we can have influence and we can have channels on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and all of these things. But what we really need more than anything is the oil of the Holy Spirit in our lives to get us through. Can somebody shout amen? We have to have enough oil of the Holy Spirit, my friend. Now listen, that's different than charisma. It's, it's, different, it's different than charisma. Char, charisma is this, this, this innate thing upon a person that brings attraction. Right? It brings attraction. It's, it's charisma. That, that, that's different. And I will say this. When you don't have the Holy Spirit or enough oil in your life, you will result to doing things that are foolishness in the sight of God. I thank God for all of this. The building, the sound system, the lights, the projection, I, all of it. I, I thank God for it because it's all tools. But none of this is going to save somebody. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's just none of it's going to deliver somebody. None of it's going to take somebody out of darkness and bring them into the marvelous light. You know what we'll do with the preaching, the unadulterated preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's got enough power within it to heal the sick, deliver those who are afflicted, and to bring people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. It has enough power in and of itself. And I thank God for these things, but these things can't deliver a person. These things can't put oil in a person. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And you may be saying, well, well, I'm still young. I got a lot of oil to, to, to get me to the end of my race. The, the Bible doesn't say anything about the age of the five or the ten women that were in this story. Because you don't know when your race is going to end. Well, I got, I got 30, 40, 50 more years. Really? Really? How you know that? Who told you that? I never met nobody that said, today I'm going to have a heart attack and die and meet Jesus. I just never met him. Today I'm going to be driving. Someone's going to cross the double yellow line, come into my lane where I'm just driving, going to work, and smash head on into me. And take my last I've never met anybody that just said, hey, today, today that's going to happen. We don't know. We need enough oil of the Holy Spirit to not only finish our race, but to walk in dominion while we are finishing our race. I'm not talking about just having enough oil to get to the finish line. You know, if you ever watched like Indy racing, right, Formula One racing, NASCAR Racing, sprint car, racing, whatever it is. I mean, they go left, right? That's the cliff notes. They go left. They drive fast, and they just keep going to the left, right? But, 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 but every once in a while, they got to stop at a pit stop. They got to pull in. They have to pull in to a pit stop. And in this pit stop, one of the things that they need is fuel. 
They need fuel. If they don't get fuel, they're not going to make it to the end of the race. And for those of you that have claimed the name of Christ, the Holy Spirit is the fuel of God that gets us moving and gets us towards the end of our race. I'm not talking about just getting enough to get to the finish line. I'm talking about enough to be victorious in every area of your life. I'm talking about enough oil to stay praying for the sick. I'm talking about enough oil to still cast out demons. I'm talking about enough oil to take new territories for Jesus. I'm talking about enough oil to advance the kingdom of God. Can somebody shout amen? That's what I'm talking about. Enough oil to be used of God while you're here. So that way, when you skip past the finish line, all of heaven is like, wow, look what you just did. You took territories. You cast out demons. You healed the sick. You built buildings. You advanced the kingdom of God. Look what you did while you were here. Wow. You took it to the last moment of the oil. You coasted in. You got in there. There was nothing left. That's where we want to be. We want to be to the point that we have given everything in our lives to God while we are here. So that way when we pass from this life to the next, the, the, the God look up there and say, wow, I can't even believe he did that. The great cloud of witnesses are standing there and they're like, I, what did you just do? Years ago, we had a, uh, a Ford Taurus. Any, anybody know where the Ford Taurus is? Yeah. It was silver. I did some really silly things I'm not going to get into, but I traded my wife's car in one time, and she didn't know about it. And, um, yeah, she looked at me like I was crazy. And, um, and, and so eventually, though, we, we, we get this Ford Taurus, and it was a good car. Right at the time, it was a good car and uh, family car. We could get our children in the back seat. Good car, silver car, black interior, and it lasted a, quite a long time. And 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 then one day, you know, some time later, uh, I'm driving. Uh, I'm going up Route Nine, Route Nine North. I'm I'm headed up Route Nine North, and all of a sudden, a couple of the lights on the dash, they come on, and I'm like, oh no, and uh, and then a couple of more lights on the dash. Come on. And I'm like, oh, no. And then I'm losing power in the car. And, um, and I, I wasn't as smart back then as I am now. So I kept driving it. All right, you know what I'm talking about? I kept driving it. I'm like, I don't want to get stuck on the side of the road. I have to get a tow truck. Maybe I can get it to a gas station, a service station. More lights came on. Now I'm pressed on the, the accelerator, and I'm not going anywhere. I'm going like two miles an hour on Route 9. And you know how treacherous that road can be. People are blowing their horn. People are yelling at me. They're giving me the jersey salute. You know, they're doing, doing, doing all this stuff. I'm like, I can't. I can't. There's nothing I can do. And then all of a sudden, I started to smell this rancid smell. It's terrible. Terrible, terrible smell as the car died, and I coasted off to the side of the road. And, um, yeah, it was pretty uncomfortable. And um, got a toad and to the shop, and, and then they gave me the bad news. I, I blew the engine. I blew the engine. I mean, the whole engine, not just part of the engine. I blew, blew all I blew up the whole engine. That's what, that's what I'm trying to say. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness there, the, everything in it. And I, and I blew up the whole engine. Evidently what happened was the water pump went out on it. That was the first light. That was the first one that I ignored. And, uh, and, and then so after the water pump went out, I, I'm not an auto mechanic, I promise you. I barely changed the oil in my own car. But, but, but the water pump is important because it cools the engine, right? It takes the antifreeze that's in there, and it circulates it through the engine. So that way, while you're driving it, everything stays cool. And, and my water pump had gone, and it told me the first light. If I would have pulled over right there, it would have been a couple hundred dollars, right? A couple of hundred 
$6 for a water pump inconvenience, but no, not me. No, no if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it right. You know, I'm going to do it all the, all the way. And, uh, and, and so that smell, the entire engine blew up. Nothing left. Probably cost six or seven thousand dollars in order to replace the engine. Because it was better to replace the engine than the car, because the car was in good shape. Leviticus chapter 6, verses 12 through 13 says this The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it, it shall not go out. But the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall lay out the burnt offering on it and offer up in smoke the fat portions of the peace offering on it. Fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. Of all the jobs, of all the functions that the Old Testament priests had in their temple duties. The number one priority of the priests. The number one priority. It wasn't going and finding, you know, uh, uh, doves with no spots or blemish. It wasn't to find lambs without spot or blemish. It, it wasn't to kick out Gentiles. It wasn't to make sure that women could not come into the outer courts. It was none of those things. Their number one function, their number one job, their number one responsibility is to make sure that the fire on the altar of God did not go out. What's the Bible say about us? That we are a kingdom of what? Priests. We are a kingdom of priests. Verse 14, 13 says, Fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. I wonder, my friend, what it would look like if every one of us were set ablaze by the fire of God in our lives. If every one of us was so passionate about making sure that the fire did not diminish, that it wasn't just a spark, it wasn't just a, a flicker, but it was a raging inferno in our lives, and that God could speak to us and we would obey Him and we would respond. What would it look like if every one of us were passionately on fire for Jesus, what would that even look like? But that's also managing God's stuff. Because that oil is not ours. I can't create it. I can't manufacture it. I can't even buy it. In the book of Acts, they asked where they could buy the Holy Spirit. And the apostle just rebuked them. You, you can't buy it. You can't manufacture it. You can't create it. The only thing you can do is receive it and make sure that you keep feeding it with the wood of the word of God and allow the wind of the spirit of God to blow on it and get, make a, a great big inferno in our lives. D.L. Moody said it this way. In closing, and I'm going to ask for the worship team if you all would please come at this time. D.L. Moody said it this way in closing. I believe this is a mistake a great many of us are making. We're trying to do God's work with the grace God gave us 10 years ago. Wow. We say if it's necessary, we'll go on with the same grace now what we want is a fresh supply, a fresh anointing, and fresh power. And if we seek it, and seek it with all of our hearts, we will obtain it. How many of us are still functioning with an old grace? An old anointing? Let me tell you something. And I'm going to shoot straight with you. You could be a minister, a lay minister, a pastor, a lay person. But if you try to function without the Holy Spirit and His anointing in your life in any area, you will not be successful. It's God's seal of approval upon you. And that's going to mean that you're going to have to consecrate yourself. That means that you're going to have to spend time in God's Word. That means that you're going to have to watch out with the things that you watch, the things that you see, the things that you hear, the things that you do. 
If you want to be used by God, we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, you say, Pastor, I've been functioning in an old anointing and in an old grace, and I want God to refresh me in a new way today. I want you to just lift your hand up right where you are. Come on, hands are going up all over this building. Hands are going up all over the building. There's nothing to be ashamed about it. Listen, we already know. We can see it. God already knows. He can see it. How do you know? You, you know because you've been withdrawing. He knows because he can see that you're not walking in the same kind of faith, power that you once used to walk in. God knows. So this is what I want to do. I'm going to ask if everyone would please lift your hands at this time. If everybody would please lift your hands at this time. And we're going to pray together that the floodgates of heaven would open up in our lives. That the floodgates of heaven would open. And not just water would flow from those floodgates, but the power of the Holy Spirit would flow from those floodgates in our lives. And what used to be hard is now easy. What used to be conflict is now peace. What you've been praying about in the past is now coming to pass in your life. So Father, we pray today in Jesus' name that the power of the Holy Spirit would fall from heaven upon us like dew in the morning. Fill our cups, O oh God, afresh. Earth is the Lord's. Everything in it. Let us not be like the ten women that went out and didn't have enough oil to go into the party. We want to be like the ones, O oh God, that are filled with fresh manna, filled with fresh oil, filled with fresh fire. That we will have faith to believe you for things that others would say are impossible. That we'll have faith to trust you for things that others would say impossible. Minister Sarah and John, God never asks us if we have enough money to do what he's called us to do. He never stops and says, do you have it? There's no place in any of Scripture that God says, I want to know before I send you if you have enough resources. What God says is, do you have enough faith? Do you have enough vision? Do you have enough passion? Do you have enough commitment when, when things don't work out right that you just go back again? And so, God, I pray. Come on. I want you to extend your hands towards Minister Sarah and John. Would you guys please stand at this time? They're building a church, a Christ church in Liberia, West Africa, along with a school for children. They're doing that right now. We've been working with them. They're believing God to be able to put a school building up. They need thirty. What is it, $30,000? Is that what you told me or more? Just tell me how much. You need $50,000. They need $50,000 to put a school up in Liberia, West Africa. And this is just not any school. This is a school that's going to train young people to be leaders in their community. They will, they, they will be pe future pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and teachers. They will be future mayors and governors and presidents of corporations. These will be leaders. Would you join me in prayer for them? God has given them a big vision. And we're praying today that not only will God give them the resources that they need, but that God would fill them up with fresh oil. Amen. So, Father, we pray for them right now. We pray for Minister Sarah and John. We anoint them from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. God, give them everything that they need. In Jesus' name, amen. God never asked them before he gave them that vision and said, hey, you have enough money to do this? They've already put up a building over there.
They've already met with architects and engineers. In fact, they're building stuff right now as we're talking. There are people out there that are putting bricks and stone together and digging wells and putting in all sorts of underground utilities. They're not waiting. God never asks us, do we have it? He just says, go in faith and vision. And when you go in faith and vision, God gives it to you along the way. Well, I'm waiting for God to show it to me and give me everything I need. You'll, you'll never do it. You'll never do it. You will die a dreamer instead of dying as a builder. So, Father, we thank you so much for this day. We know that you've done something very special in our midst. so grateful and thankful for it. For we know, Lord, that unless the Lord builds the house, those that labor, they labor in vain. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome Deaconess Lori as she comes. Thank you. That's what I call managing God's stuff with excellence. Amen. Thank you for that powerful word, Pastor Brian. I can tell you, my father was a car man, and so I do understand the importance of oil. <laughs> Never run out. And I tell you what, sometimes doing God's work, it's tiring. And you do need to stop and take that pit stop and get recharged and refueled. It's okay. What I love about our God is he doesn't expect us to be perfect. He just expects us to run the race with excellence. And I know, for me, it's all about honor. You know, we forget. We think, oh, look what I've done. Look what I have. It all belongs to him, as Pastor Brian shared. We're just managing. We're just good stewards of what he gave us. And it's all about honoring him, saying, Lord, thank you for giving me what you gave me. Thank you. I thank you that I'm going to run the race well, that my oil will never run dry, that everything I have is because of you. Amen. And in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, it says this, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. We don't want yesterday's wine, yesterday's oil. We want new each and every day. And when we honor the Lord with what he's given us, he will provide that and more. Amen. And so today, as we prepare for an offering and our tithes, I want you to think about what God has given you, what he's asked of you, what you're managing. Are you managing it well? Say, Lord, it all belongs to you anyway. I'm going to give it my best and trust that you're going to do the rest. Amen. When you came through the doors, you should have received an offering envelope. Please make that check payable to Christ Church. At the end of service, there are offering baskets on the side. There's also an usher in the back. Give God your best. He's given you it all. Amen. You can also give electronically by smart giving, by Zelle, by PayPal. Just give. We cannot outgive him. The oil will not run dry when we put him first. Amen. Amen. Are we ready to give today? Can we stand? We lift up our gifts to the Lord. Father, we thank you for that word. Let it be a reminder that with the Holy Spirit, we can do all things. Continue to refuel us and refresh us and recharge us as we do your work so we can run the race with excellence. And at the end of it, you can say, well done, faithful servants. Lord, use these gifts to bless your kingdom inside the church, outside, and even worldwide, oh God. Use us mightily as your stewards. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, you are dismissed. Thank you for choosing to worship with us in today's service. Now, join us on Zoom to have a good time talking with other Christ Church members. It's a safe place for you to interact and receive prayer in a private breakout room. We understand that life gets busy, so if you're not able to join Zoom at this time, text the word CC online to 94. 
0-0-0 to receive notifications about our midweek gatherings, or you can email questions, membership inquiries, or prayer requests to info at ChristChurchNJ.com. We look forward to seeing you soon. Have a wonderful week.